Lethal Company taking the world by storm is both a very empowering and intimidating thing to me. It's amazing because it's a creativity-fueled game that strikes at emotions I don't normally get from the soulless dredge. The bad news for me is that I'm willing to be mean to a corporation, but if there's one person I'm afraid to make fun of, it's a furry. Lethal Company is a scary four-player co-op game, a very bold statement that has yet to be pulled off. And I mean that. There are four-player co-op horror games, but not scary ones. Even the scariest horror games aren't working correctly when Kyle is in the call beside you. But Lethal Company asks the question, what happens when Kyle is two rooms away and his laughter quickly and suspiciously stops? Then you creep over only to find his dropped flashlight as your voice echoes into the hallway, only to be met back with a barely audible rattling sound in the distance. Lethal Company brings a very special brand of horror that directly plays on its social element. All communication is done directly with proximity chat, and if you boot up Discord, God instantly makes up his mind about you. The monsters aren't just gonna run up and kill you, they're gonna find a way to do it that scares the shit out of all of your friends. Take the Bracken, for instance, a monster that stalks from the shadows until you notice. If you don't spot the Bracken in time, it will quickly and silently snap your neck before dragging your body miles away, leaving your flashlight and loot lying on the ground your friends none the wiser to your sudden demise, though they might appreciate the silence. The most reliable way to be saved from it is to be notified by someone that it's following you. I made this point in other videos, but Lethal Company is best enjoyed when you are a clueless little rube to be toyed with. I have the content creation speed of this video of Kiryu typing. I imagine you have played it by now, unless you have literally no friends. It's not an impossible game to figure out either. You can scan every monster then read its database at home. First time you'll play, you'll see a small gap and say, that doesn't look too bad, then get to watch your friends enjoy the game for the next 10 minutes. By the end of it, you'll be staring down the barrel of a 2000 credit quota that you cannot ever hope to overcome unless you use God's little loophole called More Company. Or you could join in a group of randoms if you love uncomfortable silence, only broken by the guy on the ship who massively overestimates his importance. Lethal Company puts you in the role of a salvage worker for The Company, a shadowy group that will definitely pay you when this is done, as long as you're cool with spending that money on flashlights and a single TV channel. You will select from a list of moons, land, and then try to make a beeline for a grim gray series of hallways because time is money. You will scan for objects, try to pick up anything that looks like it's worth a cent, before you realize that the rattling sound is getting suspiciously closer. You have 11 minutes until the day is up and your ship leaves, whether you're on it or not. As time goes on, new monsters will spawn both in and outside. The start of the day is relatively peaceful, while 10 p.m. looks like a normal night in New Jersey. You must reach a certain number of income before three days have passed. On the fourth day, you will be forced to go to the company building in order to sell everything and, of course, lie to the new guy about how the bell works. You can spend that income on menial objects before being set back into the wild and asked to do it again, but this time with a higher quota to meet. Congrats, that's it. In labor, there's no winning, only surviving a little longer. However, Lethal Company deserves praise for just how emergent its storytelling is. You can get separated from your friends after a monster's attack splits you up, and you wander the halls of this miserable concrete maze, wondering if they're alright, if you're the last person alive, if you can even find the fucking way back. As the clock slowly ticks down, increasing the stakes bit by bit, God willing you can make it home in the middle of the night, First, you gotta pick a moon. You could save up to go to the more expensive moons, but this is also a galaxy where the moons are less defined by their unique flora and fauna, and more by the fucking weather. The moons do have differences between them, where the objective is, what monsters are likely to spawn, but for 90% of the player base, that doesn't mean jack shit. You wanna know what does? Turning the map into an endless loading screen. Any weather effect is a risk not worth taking because they range from stuff like slowly bring the map underwater and soft lock yourself into game over. The fog is the worst because you literally cannot see through it. There is an upgrade that will allow the ship to make a loud noise, but for the most part, I don't think it's worth it. And Eclipse, that is, spawn in front of death. You can go to the most expensive planet in the game and have an easier time than if you went to the starting planet on a stormy day. Of course, they wouldn't charge you $700 to visit Titan if there weren't reasons. The more expensive maps have modifiers that make the dungeons more complex and spawn more loot. 
Two of the expensive maps even totally change the aesthetic sometimes, warping the miserable factories into miserable mansions. The halls are cobbled together by the AI and have at least two entrances. The front door, which is your primary way in, and then there's the fire escape that you will use when a big scary monster starts blocking the front door. At the start of the day, there will be no enemies, just bugs and birds and oh, bugs. Every few in-game hours, a new monster gets spawned. Sometimes it's a minor nuisance like the snare flea, other times it's the coil head, which takes inspiration like I do medication. The coil head snaps your neck and kills you instantly, but only approaches you when you're looking at it. You must juggle maintaining eye contact while watching for landmines in the Mariana Trench. Then there's the jester who you counter by running out screaming, telling your friends that there's a jester. Once the jester pops open, it kills you in one shot and moves faster than you could ever hope to along with offering no suitable way of stopping it. You're better off with the bees. Speaking of bugs, there's one that will lay in the ceiling like a landmine. If a teammate gets this on them, you need to either kill it with a shovel or direct them to an exit. No, 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 out. The fire escape can also come in handy when you're running around like a crazy person holding four bits of loot and the way you got that loot feels so far away. Which is to say that if you get lost, you could just keep pressing the forward key and maybe you'll find a new way out. The prize of every map is this apparatus. It's worth a ton of money, but it's also powering the entire place. So if you plop it out, the lights turn off before this big message pops up telling you that somehow things are gonna get worse, as if that's fucking news. There's also several tools to keep yourself safe. At the monitor, you can open up a store. Stuff like flashlights and walkie-talkies so that you can communicate from far away. You are listening to Rock FM. Rock, rock, and more rock. <laughs> Don't get too excited about the options. There's only one gun in the shop and it costs several hundreds of dollars while also not killing half the enemies in the game. There is a shotgun, but if you want that... <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the items in the shop are based on information, like a spray can that can leave a mark or a trail to find your way back home. The signal booster can leave a point that the monitor guy can always watch, and the boombox can keep everyone happy. Basically, 90% of the items have the value of a spirit Halloween. However, you should buy them anyway. I promise, your head will start to split after the 10th match that starts with someone piping up and going, Can we buy flashlights? Listen, bitch, they gave us the right click. Get in there and scavenge like a real employee. Yes, you could optimize by only buying the flashlights, but then you're doing yourself a real disservice. If you're playing with losers that are hell-bent on winning Lethal Company, despite the fact that you get ejected into space no matter what, here's my advice. When it's selling time, quietly watch as everyone goes and loads stuff onto the conveyor belt. You man that computer. There's no getting you off of it unless they kill you or teleport you off. Buy all the bullshit you can dream of. Then sneak back into the crowd. Keep that mouth shut. If you're a known jokester, you need to just ride the silence. Though, if you are caught, it's too fucking late. They might fire back by tossing your stuff into the ocean, but you'll settle for a half victory. If you are outnumbered by soulless husks, you need to accept that it's not about using the cool items, but making sure that they're broke. Repeat until you don't have friends anymore. Anyway, if you have fun Lethal Company people, here's some of the stuff you can expect. You only have four slots for inventory. That includes loot. So every item is another cookie pan you'll have to leave behind. Sometimes it's better to not bring an item at all. Or just pick one guy out of your group and gear him up. Flashlight, walkie-talkie, shovel, lock picker, whatever he needs. Then, when a bracken snatches him to the ends of the earth, you may all scratch your heads wondering if a shovel is worth that weird pickle you found. Everything you carry also lovingly takes up weight, slowing you down. A feature I find, um, moderately frustrating and would like removed. This begets the process of dropping everything near the entrance so that you can make shorter trips. The ending of the day will tend to involve everyone emptying their inventory and hauling all the shit across the map. For those people that like games where delivery towards a ship in a foreign place is enthralling, or as the normal people call it, Pikmin. Also, if you say, notice your friend is carrying that funny little mask, the teleporter makes a player drop everything they were carrying. So hit the button, quickly grab it off the floor, and in the vein of being social creatures, there's the monitor. 
the ship has a map of the entire complex on its front computer, alongside several other functions like detecting enemies, loot, teleporting people in and out, and being able to bring up a nice little warm blanket. Meaning that it's always smart to have one player stay on the ship. Once you decide who will do that, it's usually time to order some items. Three of you go into the dungeon, or seven of you if you like to order the specialty slices. The ship has dozens of little buttons on the screen, but most of the work will be done at the monitor, which cheekily works like a DOS computer. Everything must be typed out in coordination with the fascist doctrine of the old IBM computer. The words must be exact, which can lead to the very first death by typo. A lot for me because I have the urgency of this one video of Kiryu typing. I kid, on the monitor you're never actually in trouble. Until 3 p.m. Then the moon starts spawning monsters outside the dungeon. The two most prevalent threats to you are the eyeless dogs and the tree that eats you. The big guys can only get you if you walk too close to the door, but the dogs will detect you via sound, especially the sounds you might make over the radio. But there's also Sadako. She will target the person with the highest fear, meaning the one who sees the most amount of bodies. There are some high-level upgrades for the ship itself that will improve functionality for the guy on said ship. There are two teleporters, one that will emergency evacuate someone, and another that will shoot some guy so far into the dungeon that you can shrug your shoulders and assume he's never coming back. On the idea of the first teleporter, if you notice that someone isn't moving on your map for a suspiciously long amount of time, hit the button and see his body flop on the ground. This saves you money and might even be delicious if you put enough salt on it. Thankfully, you're not defenseless. There's a door system that takes from the ship's battery, which, well, fuck you too. If you shut the door, you're safe. The dogs can't break in to get you. Neither can your friends, though. So if you shut it at the wrong time, you might briefly hear someone banging on the door screaming before being cut off. Then you have the pussy corner, nestled right over here. Here you are mostly safe from anything, provided you stay quiet and remember the lever right here. It is a natural instinct to run over here. And I think the game knows about this, because my character suspiciously puts their hands up over here, and might even be getting fired for odor. Remember, you're the team's lifeline. If you die, no one in the dungeon has a chance of knowing. They're relying on you to take off if things go south, because if everyone dies, the ship takes off and you lose everything inside. Not just the loot you got from this expedition, but the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that. Then you get to just live out the last depressing day of the cycle waffling around, because how the fuck are you gonna get $700 in a day? If the fellas out there couldn't agree on who's watching the coil head, they'll usually force the vote and make the ship leave. Dead players have no way of talking after all, or even a way of telling you they're dead. So if things look unsavable, they'll order the ship to leave, taking you with it and offering a humble way of communicating that was somehow so fucking hard for them a minute ago. You can also look at the monitor and look at the dots. If they're not moving, they're probably not doing all right. But if you notice one of the boys wandering back and forth in a room without purpose, be sure to teleport him onto the ship. I can promise you, he probably really wants to shake your hand. Finally, there's managing the quota. The quota is the amount of money required to keep playing. You want to keep that fucking romantic table? Better come back with 20 cans of Coca-Cola, buddy. You gotta land your ship at the company building and sort through the storage box. See, you don't lose all of that loot after you're done here at the company building. You can funnel that loot towards your next quota. Congrats, you are now a hoarder. Not that you weren't already, just in the yard outside the front door. Left there so you could all march in single file. Then you have the decor, which is objectively a waste of money. But god fuck you, spend that anyway. What is the joy if you can't play a casual horror game with people and not go on a date in the middle of space? I'm not a game designer, but there is one thing I'd like. The game hits a brick wall after a while. I would like to be able to spend some money on a larger ship. The current one looks like what I deserve, but once I get the cash together, I'd really like another room or two. Somewhere to store the knickknacks and other stuff. I would like to see some real progression if it's not gameplay stuff, possibly letting me buy permanent decorations that will be available during any run, just so that it doesn't all feel like it's for nothing. Because eventually the quota will be too big. There is no end point, just grind to get out until you get fired. I wonder how long you live in the vacuum of space. Probably until the dehydration gets you, and any way of speeding up the process is probably worse. There you go, that's Lethal Company. Basically, enjoy being fucking horrified, then watch as someone plays low-quality Hatsune Miku through their mic. Enjoy it while it's here, because lord knows you're not getting into that Helldivers lobby anytime soon. And once you learn it all, you need to resort to mods like a fucking addict. Nah nah man, I'm cool, but I really could use the Bracken reskinned as Freddy Fazbear, because nothing scares me more than a furry. 
Hey, thanks for watching. You know the deal. It's time to thank the people on Patreon who made this video possible. God bless you. Don't you dare fucking skip their names. I'll cut you. CLX7R, Coldeneye1, Castle Maniac, Anthony R. Chambers, Colorado Ranger, Gremlin Broke My Video Game, Eric Bloom, Ethan A., Jonah Simpson, Pyrozine, Sturmfetter, Rec Ren, Sparkbolt120, Mario Fan 997 Tracy Leroy, and My Reed. Now, if you don't mind me, I'm a, I got a cue to sit through, alright? I'm a busy guy.